But when you start realizing that most of these trees are sold to you for about 25 to 30 dollars at the nurseries, it just unlocks a whole new level of food forestry. It really lets you level up and scale your food forest at very low cost. So I'll take a bunch of these mature canes and then I'll use trays like this to harvest all these fruit. I could cut this down, I could chop it into about seven bits and then put each of those maybe 10 to 12 inch lengths in those pots fill a pot up with soil, a rather large pot, and then just put a bunch of cuttings in. And once they develop root systems, once you see at the bottom the root systems start poking out, then you can pull all these out. And as they develop, I can just pull as many trees out as I need for whatever project or whatever installation I'm working on at the time. It's got two layers of things. It's got a shade cloth and then a wire mesh. Growing a food forest does not have to be expensive, especially if you can propagate your own plants. I'm going to show you what I've been doing over the last three years to make my food forest less and less expensive to plant every single year, despite planting a larger and larger area every single year. So let's jump in, got an exciting, really valuable video for you guys. Here we go. Most of this video is going to be about air prune beds, which is a really easy way of growing lots of fruit trees from seed, very cheap, and they're perfect for going into your food forest. We'll look at the benefits that air prune beds have compared to pots. We'll look at the construction of the air prune beds, how do you build it, and then I'll show you guys how the actual thing works and why it works. At the very end, we'll look at a special bonus section for agroforestry specific propagation. So, so this thing behind me is an air prune bed that I have not yet filled up with soil or seeds, but essentially an air prune bed is designed for tree seeds. You're creating an environment where edible tree seeds can be planted. They grow into young seedlings that have really well-developed root systems. You can fit a lot of seeds in this one air prune bed. You can fit hundreds in here, very low maintenance, and especially when you compare it to pots. They take up a huge footprint because you can only fit one tree per pot, which is that big. You have to water it a lot more frequently because there's not as much soil mass and so it's going to dehydrate faster, whereas a big mass of soil this big, it's not really going to dehydrate very quickly. So once you get all your trees established, there's good canopy cover, water retention is fantastic, you don't have to really do much maintenance, even the weeding compared to pots, right? Because once all your trees establish in here, your seedlings establish, they have a full canopy cover covering the soil, there's not really sunlight for other weeds to come in, versus in pots you still are always going to have some weed pressure. So that's just a few benefits of why air prune beds are better, in my opinion, than pots, especially because just the fact that you could fit hundreds of tree seeds in this one square meter footprint, and how much space would that many trees take up in pots? It would take 300 pots, it's a, it's a huge space, it's a huge thing to manage, the watering, the weeding, no thanks. So. That's part of why I love air prune beds is just how low management they are, how low maintenance, that's really exciting. But also just the amount of trees that you can produce, fantastic for larger scale food forest systems or giving away to friends or clients or whatever your context is, you can grow tons of trees and just really simple design. So let's dive into what this actually, how it works and why it's designed the way that it is. So if you look at the side profile of it, you can see on the bottom it's got two layers of things. It's got a shade cloth and then a wire mesh. Those things help the soil stay in the box and then it's on these legs, right? On each side it has these feet that it stands on to raise it off the ground. And that's part of where the name comes from is air pruning. So what happens is you fill it with soil, you plant your seeds at the very top, which is in here. That's the top, you plant your seeds. As the plants develop, the roots come down, then the roots get to this mesh. And because there's like a two inch air gap between where the soil or the ground is, you can even do this on a parking lot or a parking space, it doesn't need to be on the ground or on the soil. Because there's that air layer, the roots hit that barrier, they poke through the shade cloth, and because they don't want to be in the air, they send a signal back up. They self prune themselves, basically causing more branched root systems rather than a big taproot which would spiral around at the bottom of a pot and would just get really root bound and not very happy for the tree. This creates a really branched, healthy root system, as well as just being able to pack tons of trees in here. So that's how the function works, is the roots come down, hit the air layer, they send that signal back up to create a more branched root system, and it self-prunes. All the trees self-prune their roots because of that air layer, because this is raised about two inches off the ground with these feet. And so when it comes to what soil or medium you're filling your air prune bed with, I actually prefer river sand because it's really coarse, it's free draining, and it doesn't even need to have a lot of nutrients in it because the seeds themselves have their own nutrients. That's what a seed is. It's its own food source to develop in that first stage of life. And so 
Fill it with a cheap material. You can also just do topsoil. But the point is, it doesn't need to be a really nice, rich compost. You need to go spend a lot of money on. Again, cheaper the better. The way you can make this accessible for people is just use what you have around. So let's go take a look at some of the more established airplane beds that I have filled up. These ones are just getting moved around because I'm shuffling some nursery stuff. But let's go look at the more established airplane beds. Some cool examples. These are some of the more established air prune beds that were all planted about a year ago. You can see there's one, two, three, four air prune beds. So I've got a different assortment of species in each one. And as time goes on, you kind of start to see, you can see I'm peeling trees out to be planted into new agroforestry systems. And so most of these were planted a year ago. This one was planted more recently. And as they develop, I can just pull as many trees out as I need for whatever project or whatever installation I'm working on at the time. So let's take a look and see what species we've got here and just take a look at the density of these trees. I think you might find it really interesting. Now obviously you wouldn't want to plant trees this close together that are the same species if this is where they were going to live more permanently but because this is just kind of like a holding zone where they're growing for that first year it's okay to plant things this densely. You can see these are more recently planted and this is the oldest one which is full of cherimoyas which again you can see I've been taking them out as the season progresses but you can see if we dive in here you can see how densely these are planted. And I'll show you a clip of when these seeds were being planted, but they go to really high density. They go into a really high density and then they come up and then the whole canopy is closed. So then there becomes no weed pressure until you start removing them. Um, but you can see in here, there's no weed pressure at all because there's just no sunlight available for the weeds. So we've got white sapote here, which again, have recently been clearing some up for projects. We've got Japanese raisin trees. And you can see how dense these Japanese raisin trees are planted. And you can see they're raised off the ground on these pallets, but there's still that gap. They've still got these legs with the shade cloth. So that's where the roots would be coming down, self-pruning and allowing these to grow into really happy branch root systems before they get pulled out and moved into their respective agroforestry systems. So I'll just reiterate the cost savings and the management time required for this. Zero management. You plant the trees, you put a little bit of mulch to keep the soil nice and moist and to keep the immediate weeds from coming up. And then you just let the trees grow and you can pretty much neglect that. I don't really pay much attention to these nursery beds. I don't need to water them. I don't really need to weed them. Maybe one round of weeding and then by then the established canopy comes out, no weeds anymore. So very little management very little cost in setting these up, just the cost of building the actual material, and of course, sourcing the seeds, which we'll talk about later. But to really prove a point, I fit about 300 cherimoyas in this one box when it was first planted. Imagine how much space, time, energy, and management 300 pots of cherimoyas would take up. Not to mention just the cost of the actual trees themselves. Like, cherimoya are not cheap trees to buy, I think, these trees, ungrafted seedlings, retail for about $30 from online nurseries, whereas, these were pretty much free, just have access to seeds, just buy some fruit, plant them in the air print bed, wait a year, and then boom, you've got really high value fruit trees ready to go into your food forest. And that's just to illustrate the cost savings, but once you start setting up multiple air prune beds, you've got 300 trees here. There was, I think, 100 trees in this one. There was another 100 white sapote in here, and then I think about 250 Japanese raisin trees. And so when you start realizing that most of these trees are sold to you for about 25 to $30 at the nurseries, it just unlocks a whole new level of food forestry. It really lets you level up and, and, and scale your food forest at very low cost. So I'll show you the first one that I ever built. It was full of mistakes, but it was fantastic for learning and just seeing what works well and what doesn't. And it's continued to be a productive space for my trees in the meantime. I think it's the oldest nursery. The oldest air prune bed is probably about three years old and it's produce over a thousand trees for my own food forest and clients. So this is it right here. It's old, it's kind of falling apart. It wasn't with treated timber and so the soil is kind of rotting things. I've switched to using treated timber now, but you can see it's still got some cherimoyas in here from last year, more white sapote, and I've pulled everything else out except for a couple inga beans. One of the other biggest differences is this is at ground level. I kind of prefer working at hip height, which is why those other ones were stacked on top of pallets. Um, just to learning that if I can incorporate it at hip height, I'll do that, but it's not obviously necessary.
So depending on your context, you might not actually need an air prune bed. It might just be better for you to direct sow your seeds, directly put them directly in your tree lines of your food forest. If you don't know what that means, check the previous video. Um, but air prune beds are fantastic for holding large amounts of seeds, especially if you're doing multiple installations at various places, or if the site isn't ready to begin putting the seeds in. That's the case for me and a lot of my clients is the trees want to be ready, but the site's not necessarily prepped yet. So this just provides a fantastic holding area. Um, so again, it might not be your context, but if it is, hopefully this has been valuable. Let's jump into some of the other alternative methods of propagation and then specifically for agroforestry systems. Just a quick interruption. If you're enjoying this video, make sure you just leave a like or a comment. It helps me know what kind of videos you guys are enjoying and are gonna be valuable for other people. Keep enjoying the video. So this is a stock pot, which is basically just a fancy way of saying fill a pot up with soil, a rather large pot, and then just put a bunch of cuttings in. And once they develop root systems, once you see at the bottom the root systems start poking out, then you can pull all these out. They'll all have each individual light root systems, and then you can pot those up into their own individual pots. This is just a really space efficient way of doing it. It's how a lot of nurseries go. Um, and it works with anything that grow from cuttings. And so whether it's a herbaceous or a woody perennial tree species, like figs, mulberries, this particular one is Okinawa spinach grows really well from cuttings. But there's all kinds of things that grow really well from cuttings that work well with this method. It's really space efficient. Um, and then you can transfer them into either their individual pots, or you can always just start out with something like this where we've got a bunch of individual cells. And same thing, Okinawa spinach, just a bunch of cuttings, each getting their own cell. So I'm not gonna have to transplant these before they go out into the ground or into whatever system they will be planted into. So just two really easy examples, stock pot, um, whatever these trays are called with individual cells. Very simple way of doing anything from cuttings. Papaya is a really common one that a lot of people in this part of the country enjoy in their food forest. And so this is how I do papayas from cutting. Very, very simple, literally as easy as that. Just take a cutting. You can see where it would have been cut right there and then it re-sprouts. So you would do that in early spring or late winter as things are warming up in the greenhouse and they should be ready for your planting mid-spring and so that doesn't take very long at all they develop root systems really quickly and that works for most of these papaya varieties that we have here in new zealand you can also grow things from seed but they won't always be true to type whereas this just absolutely confirms that it will be the exact variety um, and sex that you pulled from you can see here are some that were grown from seed right there and these ones again from cuttings so, very easy way of doing papaya propagation. This is just an example of a bunch of ice cream beans that were originally planted in a tray. So a bunch of seeds were not planted in an air prune bed, just a tray, and eventually the seeds needed a little bit more root system, so I've given them each their own pots, and these will be ready to go in spring as well. And then same here with some cherry guava, we've got some pomegranates and some other things in that similar category. So just to show you guys how easy papaya propagation is, Check this example out. So this papaya right here is absolutely loaded and it was accidentally planted here. It wasn't even actually planted. It was literally just a stump that would have been set against that water tank about a year and a half ago. Just leaned there and then I forgot about it and it set roots and look where we are now. So obviously it's happy here, but what I could quite easily do is I could cut this down once I harvest all these fruit. I could cut this down, I could chop it into about seven bits and then put each of those maybe 10 to 12 inch lengths in those pots in the greenhouse as things are warming up and they'll develop beautiful root systems. And then I'll have about 10 or 12 new papaya trees that are this exact same variety, which is exactly what I'll be doing. So that's just another example of how easy papaya propagation is. Literally didn't even plant this here, just set the stem up against the water tank. Here's the agroforestry specific propagation bonus. Now, because your agroforestry system, if you watched the previous video, you know, super important to have a lot of support species, the early succession biomass plants to support the whole progression of your food forest. And so part of what that means is you're gonna need a lot of those plants, not just one or two, but you're gonna need a lot of those plants. I'm liking to have about at least one per meter. You can see the example here is bonagrass down the whole edge, right? Lots of bonagrass or Mexican sunflower, or maybe if you're in a colder climate, it's comfrey or canna lilies or whatever herbaceous biomass species, you're gonna need a lot of it. And so the key isn't a specific technique as much as make sure you're planting 
a nursery stock to continue propagating from and every single year the installations get bigger I need more support species I need to do more propagation so establish your propagation figure it out I'll show you a quick example of what I'm using to propagate tons of bonagrass and tons of Mexican sunflower let's check it out and just for reference this is the first bonagrass that I planted here about two years ago it was from a single plant for my buddy Billy um, and I just put it straight in the ground, and this has been my nursery stock for bonagrass for the last two years. I just don't touch this one except for in late winter, early spring, and I come and I harvest the mature canes, which these will be, it'll be plenty ready. You can see here's a mature cane right there, compared to the more fresh shoots, which will be grown next year. This is what the mature canes look like, and so in spring, early spring, late winter, I'll come through and I'll cut a lot of the mature canes out of here. Set up an area where you can just leave your propagation material to just turn into your nursery stock. You just want to leave it there, you're not touching it, you're not harvesting it for organic material. You're literally just planting it and letting it do its thing, and then once or twice a year you're harvesting for propagation material. Whereas other areas, like this area, this is for biomass, so I'm not really doing much propagation out of this material because this is on the edge of the food forest system where you have our trees and plants on the inside. So, biomass, propagation, make sure you set up a propagation area. So when it comes to propagating the bonagrass, I usually do this in late winter, or early spring, is I'll take a bunch of these mature canes and then I'll use trays like this with root trainers and just fill them with soil, potting mix, whatever material, it doesn't need to be really nice, rich, composty stuff because, again, these are support species, very tolerant. And I'll just cut maybe, probably two nodes each. I wouldn't want to, you could potentially do it with one node, but I like the security of just having one node in, one node out. Fill them up, put them in the greenhouse, and then they're ready to go in about two and a half weeks. So that's really simple, and it's very similar with the Mexican sunflower. You just take the mature wood like that, similar length, get a couple nodes in there, and then boom, you fill a tray up really easily. And if you can get a hold of a bunch of these, man, your agroforest, your food forest system will just advance so quickly, you'll produce so much organic material. So the key thing here is that your food forest is going to produce a ton of propagation material regardless. It's going to explode in propagation material, whether that's from seeds from your tamarillos, from vegetative material, from things like your bananas, your sugarcane, your mulberries, your figs, which you can take cuttings from, your tubers, which we haven't even covered here. You've got a bunch of herbaceous perennial vegetables and herbs, which can easily be propagated from cuttings. Here are some tubers like yacon, which, again, really simple. Dig tubers up, replant the propagation material. And while we're here looking at bananas, I'm not going to go in depth because they deserve their own entire video and how they fit into agroforestry system and propagation and management. So we'll we'll look at that another day. But hopefully this video has been valuable. All right, guys, that was the propagation video. Hope it was helpful. I hope you learned something that you can apply to your own food forest to help lower the cost and ultimately help other people create their own food forest at a lower cost as well because this stuff should all really be accessible for everyone. It's just a matter of learning and practicing and seeing what works well in your specific context. And so, again, hope you got a lot of value. See you in the next one.